So there are motivating questions um, from the three areas. So an architect could ask, what determines when an urban space is pleasant to live in? A neuroscientist could ask, how do we perceive the aesthetics of the environment and what influence has on our body? And as a roboticist, I could just ask, how do you make it to my body? The long-term aims of this project are to design and implement a physiologically inspired emotion module for a companion robot. When if we have this module, we can transfer it in a simulation from simulated agent and use it in software for architects. So that they can explore their 3D plans in simulation. Um, so this presentation covered examples how emotions could be implemented, evidence that the environment has impact on the emotional system, a proposal of an emotion module for robots, and intermediate result, results that illustrate what is involved. The first example I want to mention are the vehicles of Valentino Breitenberg. Um, for his thought experiments, he used simple vehicles that had two light sensors at the front and two wheels at the back. The connections from the sensors to the wheels could be parallel or cross, or could be excitatory or inhibitory. Depending on this configuration, the vehicles have different behaviors. Interesting for us is that these simple behaviors were associated with quite complex human emotions. So you see here, cowardly, aggressive, loving, quietly, adoring, loving, exploring. For example, the vehicle on the right, so it receives light at the left center, the right wheel would be accelerating with pressure with the light source. So this would be the implementation of aggressive behavior. The next example is a step up from these vehicles. That is the ER7 from the IGO robot that was built from 2003 to 2006. It had touch sensors at the head and at the back. And if you touched it or pet it, it could emit some sound of pleasure and also show some gestures. So this dog is usually a start school open days and uh, quite a lot of research projects that use the IGO dog in connection with children's studies and emotions. There's also an IGO emotion corpus. The third example I wanted to mention um, is for a bottom-up approach. Well, the first two examples we call a top-down approach of implementing emotion. And this is a candy lawyer's proposal on meta-learning neuromodulation and emotion. Um, he summarizes a wide range of results in neuroscience and proposes seven correspondences between fundamental machine learning concepts and characteristic circuits in the different brain areas. So the cerebellum is a specialized organism for food device learning, the bizarre ganglia are for reinforcement learning, the cerebral cortex is unsupervised learning. He also provides some explanations for the parameters of these algorithms could be interpreted in terms of neurotransmitter functionality of dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, and noradrenaline. Now, the aim of our proposal is to provide a physiologically motivated top-down approach that can be regarded as a step up from the IBO robot. Somewhere in between the second and the third example. And questions that could emerge in this context are what are emotions and how can we measure them? Is there a link between the architectural environment and emotions? Are there any visual features that cause emotions, and how could they be implemented? Now, there are many different definitions of emotions, um, and we already heard about several techniques how they could be measured through verbal description, heart rate, infotype, and EEG, and the startle reflex. Um, one of a recent study by one of my co-authors and his colleague, uh, Kaishan Wall, used the startle reflex. So that's the eye blink component of startle reflex, so you get a clapping sound and then blink and you can measure the change in the muscular activity. Um, so they selected six 
spiders of modern powers with different median real estate drugs, increasing from 4,780 to 12,090 euro per square meter. And then they used about 20 volunteers to perform virtual work tools for these areas on the computer. And then they have the staple reflexes. I believe it, at least I think it was flex of at least 40 seconds. And the general results they obtained in the study is the subjective ratings. And they were correlated with the real estate price, as you see in the upper graph. And in the lower graph, you see that the um, cheapest area uh, results in significantly different uh, startup response than the most expensive area. So this gives us an objective measure of emotion and a positive answer to our question. Is there a link between the visual appearance of architecture and body reactions of the observer? However, we still don't know what are the visual features and how can they be calculated. For this, we look at two other concepts. And one of them is the fractal dimension. And there are a number of other studies that provide physiological indication. And among them is uh, the studies of Taylor and Hagerow. And they support the hypothesis that patterns of mid range fractal dimensions cause the least stress to the body. So you must imagine that if you want to go to a jungle, it's a very fractal behavior, a fractal image, very irregular. Um, so that is not. If you are not used to that, it causes stress to the body. Or if you go to a very tight house, everything is very straight and concrete. It has a very low fracture dimension that also causes stress to the body. But somewhere in the middle, it houses some trees and mixture that are most comfortable to us. Um, we implemented a fracture dimension calculator by a box counting. And, um, the several images. For example, here we see um, uh, two images on, on the left. We have uh, trees included, also on the right, not. And so here we extracted just the skyline. So we could also extract other edges. But okay, we just focused on the skyline and calculated fractal dimension. So we improved the trees, the fractal dimension increases. The nice thing with this um, concept is that it can be implemented in a few lines of code and put on the robot. And so we can actually calculate what emotion or body reaction the robot should have. And okay, we also compare different cities in Amsterdam and the city in China, and then we can compare the different skylines. Okay, so that would be one useful feature which we can use. And the other one are facial expressions. So we know that the human brain is very specialized on evaluating um, facial expressions. Um, they can communicate emotions and can be processed not consciously and independently from visual attention. Um, now, given a digital image, we can first search for a face then put a box around it, and then take the interior of the box and apply a facial expression classifier. Um, here, the facade that we see in that slide, that was assigned the emotion in fear by our system. Now, our hypothesis is uh, that the face processing system in the brain is critical for how humans perceive and interpret the environment. And this applies not only to real faces, but to any abstract pattern that may resemble a facial expression. And you might have seen a Martin Oswald poster outside on our Paradoia sub project. But now our proposal for the robotic emotion module is to take these features, so for example, I mentioned Paradoia, colors as well, and some other features. And map them on a set of discrete emotions that the robot can express by language. Um, we have this implement the 
implementation is work in progress, so the last year I forgot to already said some words about of the right ones yet. Um, so it's not that easy as expected. And the next step is now to evaluate and improve the robot's behavior using reinforcement learning and interaction with humans. So I would be a companion robot and can talk to the robot and then he says, oh, I'm feeling happy here, and then I say, that's not the right <laughs> Um, and the last step then is to uh, transfer the trained emotion module into simulations of the architect. So that's a three step approach, and I would call this the remote pedestrian approach. My robots are employed to bridge the, the gap between human subjects and fully simulated agents. And I want to report on a closely related sub project that we did. It used robot pedestrians about finding a way to estimate the gaze vector from fronting a video of human pedestrians. So it might be of interest to architects if you take a video of people walking through the street. And you can, if you can detect the gaze vector, then you know exactly what they're looking at. That might be interesting um, objects in the environment. But it's very difficult to actually estimate that gaze vector. And so we use robots uh, to develop a method for that. Um, you can do that first in the lab. Um, in the photo, we see two robotic pedestrians walking down the model street. The head direction is recorded internally from the sequence of the neck joint. So we can't really do that with given the robots that they know about it. And and then also externally from an overhead camera, you see that color pattern on the head, which gives us a pretty precise signal. And that should be actually more precise than the frontal video. But um, we still have issues here. There still was a lot of noise involved. And on this graph, you see the external and the internal signal at the top. So the head pans around, but it's similar, but it's not identical. In the middle is the der derivative of the two lines at the top and at the bottom is the acceleration. And these peaks would be interesting moments where the robot suddenly discovers an interesting pattern in the environment and moves his head towards the pattern. Now, in the real world, we would have to use frontal video. That might become difficult because the noise level is so high. Um, and also, the resolution can be quite coarse when we have humans or robots here in the distance. Now, in order to improve the position, we, um, we projected the manifold, which we calculated from the frontal robot's head that we recorded in the previous image. You saw that onto a simulation. So here's now the robot pedestrian approach again where we combine the robots with a simulation. And the simulation can be with very high precision and can discover that if you rotate about two axes that then actually have rotation can be represented by a torus. And now we can represent the project the video images onto the torus and that way increase the precision of the video. And the details of this project on the paper of Alan Wong, the PhD about this. Um, then we do a simulation project that is done by another student, Arash Sanalian, which has submitted his thesis. It compares trajectories of simulated pedestrians and tracked pedestrians. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, um, a comparison of, of uh, simulated pedestrians and human pedestrians in this thesis showed very similar results. Um, good. Let's see. Yeah. So, we discussed the emotion video turns the robot's visual input of an urban space into an emotional state. And some ideas to improve that in the future with the manifold learning. Which is related to the structure, but I skip this now and say, well, yeah, so we reach our aim. We can implement on the robot a way that he feels happy when I'm 
still have to be at the same place, the same time, looking in the same direction. And I wanted to thank all my collaborators here uh, who contributed to this project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The future is here. Uh, this study jettisons the whole issue of semantic reference to urban spaces and response modes, for instance, people moving through spaces that are familiar that cause association. And so the response is complex based on their own personal relationship to, to memory. Mm -hmm. so this this really jettisons the question of memory. Yes, yes, so it's a very low-level project, yes. so it's better to get the record on the past. Yeah, so I... It's about, about memory and experience and things like that. Yeah. Right, and so I'm just wondering, as a future scenarist, uh, if you have any thoughts about where we could head in addressing the memory issues, since it's part of the research problem here. Since you're a futurist, I thought you might have some in thoughts or share with us. Yeah, well, I'm focusing more on the, on, on the very first seconds and the basic stuff. So the memory, um, well, this is the next project, I don't really talk about it too much. <laughs> it's, it's very hard to implement on a on, on robot with a colorful brain, but you can just implement a basic visual system that can already be achieved with it. And I think it's, it's often ignored by some of the other studies. They look at the more higher level things that come later. We'll be looking more at the lower level. Yes. But it is also important, I think, in particular for young conscious perception, which is also important to this uh, sort of the face perception. Right. And the only reason I raise it is because I, I do understand the necessity of starting a bit more simple is to point to the challenge that we have in moving between robots and humans. You know, there's always that, that gap that we have to address in terms of making presumptions about the effects of the built environment. Consultant in uh, robot 